Hello everyone, my name is Christian and welcome to my hobby blog. Today I'm very excited to be doing day 6 now of the 31 days of Japanese films. Today I'm very excited to be doing one of my recent uh, favorite discoveries by a director who I appreciate and love his movies so much. Uh, the director is Kaneto Shendo and this is the film from 1960. The Naked Island. I love, absolutely love, the artwork for this. It is simply a crayon uh, artist re rendition, and I find that this is a perfect sort of encapsulation of what this movie is, which is that it is backbreaking work, and it's very exhausting, and our characters... Uh, do not take a single rest the entire film. But what is the movie about? Um, I think everything you need to know about this movie is on the cover. Uh, you have two water uh, buckets that this person is carrying. And they are slightly bent, but they are filled in with uh, very stark black colors to sort of show the turmoil and the emotional uh, baggage that comes with the lifestyle of this family that we are seeing. But I'll read officially from uh, the director what this film is about. Uh, a study in the constant struggle of agrarian life, this dialogue-free black and white film depicts one family's difficult existence. Uh, the sole inhabitants of an island in Japan's Seto Inland Sea. The impoverished family sees the tough life as farmers become even more challenging when the oldest son, played by Shinji Tanaka, uh, falls deathly ill, while his parents, played by Nobuko Otoa and tai Taishi uh, Tonoyama, I apologize if I said those names incorrectly, uh, while his parents are away gathering water. Uh, confronted with this tragedy, the family must now work harder to survive. And that's really what the movie is about, is about this family uh, who are two parents, mom and dad, and the two sons. And, oh my god, uh, their lives are so hard and very hard to watch because they have to go up, a, they live on top of a steep island that is mostly rocky. And what they do is at the beginning of the day, they go and catch the breakfast, uh, fish mostly, with some crops that they have grown. And they eat that, and then they go and fill up the water, uh, fill up the water buckets for whatever use that they need them for, whether it's the crops, uh, watering the crops, or whether it's for food, uh, growing the food and... Also boiling the food, boiling rice that they have. And once they get the water, they come back. They water the plants. Then they go back out to the only uh, freshwater well that is even remotely nearby them. Which is a uh, pretty long boat's journey to get to this well. And because they are in the middle of this island, this rocky island, uh, kind of centered in the middle of the lake, um, they have a very hard life. And this entire movie is mostly no dialogue. Uh, I would say 98, 97% of the movie has no dialogue. So this movie is very visual. Uh, I think it could be a very effective silent film. But, um... One thing that's interesting that uh, surprised me when I was doing my reading up on this movie is that in his last published book before he died, uh, Kaneto Shindo noted that the film's premise of carrying the water to the island is actually false. Uh, because the crops shown being watered in the film, sweet potatoes, uh, do not actually need extensive watering. And so why did he make the actors do this? Well, he did it because uh, he deliberately made the actors carry 
uh, heavy, heavily loaded buckets of water so that the yokes they were using would be seen to bend, would be seen to bend, symbolizing the harshness of their lives. And a quick note here is that uh, this island, uh, the real island that they filmed uh, the film at, uh, the location is actually an uninhabited island uh, called uh, Sukune. I think I said that right, or Sukune, uh, which is off the coast of a larger island called uh, Sagashima, uh, which is actually part of Mihara Hiroshima. And one of the things that we see uh, on this release, at least, is a video introduction of this film by the director himself in 1999, I think maybe 2000, he died in 2001, 2002 maybe, but uh, he talks about in that video interview, which I'll revisit here in a second, is that he wanted this movie to sort of look at uh, indirect consequences to World War II, and especially of the nuclear bomb, and that was something that I never really thought about uh, before watching uh, this time, because I've seen it a number of times before, but I've never really made the link that the reason why this land is so hard to uh, live off of is that it is poisoned from the bomb that went off in Hiroshima. And that was just something really interesting that I was not expecting uh, to hear about when watching this movie, or at least watching the supplements for this release because this is a movie that could take place really at any time. Uh, there's a great interview with Benicio Del Toro, uh, the famous actor, where he's talking about his love for this film and he says it's a very primordial type of movie because they're directly dealing with the physical landscape and shaping it themselves in order to survive, which is what was happening a lot uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, and this movie actually takes place just a couple decades ago, uh, sort of in the 50s and 60s, but we never see a car, we never see uh, machines. Um, it's a really interesting setting that uh, the director chose for this one, but uh, to sort of return to that video that Kaneto Shindo recorded for this, uh, not release, but for a film festival, this film festival was actually a retrospective where everyone who went to this festival would go through Kaneto Shindo's uh, filmography and sort of talk about each one and talk about sort of everything with the director, watching it in the context of a career spanning uh, career or a long time is being covered and so the director recorded an introduction for this film specifically and that's where a lot of the info about the nuclear uh, sort of effects came in but one thing that's cool is that Benicio Del Toro actually planned and executed this uh, film festival in retrospective of all of his films, and Kaneto Shindo recorded a video message, as, as I said, uh, thanking uh, Benicio, Benicio Del Toro and also uh, the audience for coming out and watching this. And he talked about how he shot the movie on location on the island uh, with just two characters who toil uh, the most in the world, who are farmers. That's who he uh, sort of views farmers as, as people who work the hardest, uh, literally moving earth to do what they need to do. And he said, uh, he described the movie as a cinematic poem, which I thought was very interesting, uh, in that it is a piece of art, and this is a uh, sort of summation of what he says about this, but it's basically a piece of art that is comprised of a series of images that should uh, stand on its own. 
that's sort of how he approached this film. So he definitely did take a silent film approach to this movie because he wanted the images to speak for themselves. And I think they do uh, very well in this movie to sort of show the hard work and the toil and the exhaustion that our characters are facing uh, from beginning to the end. Uh, this movie is very exhausting to watch. But one thing that's interesting that I've sort of mentioned already is that there's really no dialogue in this film. And the director said that was purposefully done because the movement of the characters and the editing should inform the scenes, which I think I just mentioned already. But the thing that I really uh, vibe with the most with this movie and why I love it a lot is that uh, the characters move so deliberately as to not waste a single motion, which is something that came up during the uh, audio commentary for Seven Samurai, being that Samurai should not be wasteful in their lives. They should be able to utilize every advantage that they have. And that sort of comes into play with uh, Takashi Shimura's character, Kanbei, uh, who I talked about a lot. And that he did whatever he could to get whatever advantage that he could acquire to save uh, the boy who was the hostage. And that's exactly what this movie is about, is uh, not wasting any motion and taking any advantage that you can. Except in this movie, there are no advantages that these characters uh, have. So it's a really interesting uh, sort of observation to make. But another thing is that the music is very discordant and dreamlike uh, to give a sort of tired and exhausted sense or aura to the scene because this movie, as I've said, is very exhausting to watch. And I find that the filmmaking just really adds to that because I find it very exhausting to watch, but being able to see that every single thing was a deliberate choice by the director was very uh, fun for me as a, film lo as a film lover because that's sort of something you always think about and you won't get an answer to until you find either a really good uh, Blu-ray pack package of the film or you just kind of find out through an interview that you found online or in print. And so being able to track uh, sort of spontaneity and also innovation through uh, the beginning and the end of what the script had to go through and sort of seeing what the director chose and what he left to the actors. I find all of that very fascinating. And this movie is very deliberate and I really like it. But one thing that's really uh, interesting about this movie is that the work they are doing, which is heavily watering crops, which we uh, just discussed, the director purposely put them through that hard work even though they didn't need to because he needed some sort of activity to resemble uh, sort of or to sort of stand in as the singular thing they do every day of their lives that are keeping them uh, so impoverished which is this journey that they have to take from their island to the other coast getting the buckets of water getting it into the boat sailing back refilling all the water and doing what they need to do and then going back out to the all of that um it's all being done on a very dry island that is amongst a very salty lake that is begging to be drunk by them because there's all this water that they can just reach down and touch but all of it is salty it is not able to be drunk by them and i found that to be sort of ironic for the director to do uh, to our characters because 
they are just sweaty, the entire movie, with how much work they are doing. They are very deliberate. They're not wasting a single motion because they need all of the energy that they can. And I find that positioning them on a very rocky island that is steep, that they have to go on cross, uh, cross hatches, I believe they're called, uh, having to go up these really rocky, uneven, steep, inclines and also declines when they're going back down to the boat having to do all of that while on top of that being surrounded by cool water that they can drink technically they could drink but they can't because it's a death sentence i find that so harsh of the director to have his characters be in these conditions and i think that's just another layer to appreciate about this movie and how it all sort of comes together and I really enjoy those aspects of this film so, so much. But this movie is very exhausting to watch. It is 96 minutes, so it's not... Uh, one time-wise, it is not exhausting. But I find that the content and the actual presentation of the story to be very exhausting. And it's not a movie that I will watch often, but I really enjoy it for what it is because of everything I've already talked about. And I really like that um, this movie's cinematography is a lot less showy and deliberate as Akira Kurosawa's cinematography that he has. Because in his movie, everything is so well planned out. He has a really good eye for uh, cinematography. Kaneto Shindo, a lot more naturalistic. He's a lot more documentary style, uh, I believe, in the 60s. Uh, shortly after this, he sort of stopped making movies. Well, not stopped making movies, but he began to do a lot more TV and documentary uh, films than just narrative films like this one. And this movie could be a documentary. You could put on a subtitle in the beginning of the film that just says like the date and the names of the people and that's really all you need and you you could say you know base you know on a real story and it could be a documentary uh you don't even have to say based on this true story you could just shoot it and say this is a documentary and i don't think anyone would not believe it maybe with one event in this book or in this movie, that uh, sort of goes dark. Uh, there are people dying in this film. One of the children do die. And it's a very harrowing uh, section of the film. But outside of that, um, I think this movie could be passed off very easily as a documentary. And that's what is very fascinating about this movie. Because it is a whole lot of no dialogue characters toiling and having a rough time but they keep going and this is something that's really uh interesting to watch about this movie because they are stuck in the middle of this island uh both parents and both of the sons and you kind of think to yourself why are they still on this island and i could not come up with an answer myself because I mean, and I can't say what I would do in this situation, but it makes you sort of wonder why they can't just get off that island, move to the mainland of the island, and sort of start a new life and not be in that situation anymore. But we don't know anything about their lives before this or even uh, after this. This is just a small window into the lives. And it's something that, I wish I knew more of, but I think that's what makes this movie so fun to think about and I'm sure to talk about with others because we could spend all day sort of theorizing how they got to that island. Was the local governor uh, exiling them? Uh, were they skimping out on the taxes so they got kicked off to some horrible island that you know, nobody lives on anyways, and it's a punishment to them. We don't know. 
we never get the answers. There's very few dialogue in this scene, in this uh, movie, but these are all questions that I think are interesting to think about. And there's really not much else to talk about with this movie. Uh, it's very good. I love it a lot. Uh, it's not one that I will watch often, but I find it great. Uh, I think everyone should at least check them out. Uh, his other works include Kiran Echo, Black Cat, and also Onibaba, which is two of my favorite Japanese horror movies ever, but I've talked about both of those films so many times already on the channel. Onibaba I've done a dedicated review for, Kiran Echo I've done a dedicated review for, so I had one last movie of Kaneto Shendo that I wanted to discuss, and this was it. 1960s The Naked Island. Uh, what a great film. I love it a lot. It's not one you can watch often though. But that is it for today. Thank you all so much for watching. And please have a great rest of the evening.